Hello everyone. This morning I wasn't actually all that rushed. We started probably on time at 9 a.m. and I had plenty of time to sit here and prepare. It's always lucky. I am on baby patrol today. There's little Thomas. I don't know if you all can see this or not. He's sleeping. So that's nice. Um, when he wakes up I'll have to deal with him, but that's a-okay. James is at school. Amy's at work. And all is quiet. <laughs> so, why not make some noise and have this show for all of you? Today, we're going to be talking about assumptions. Because people mess up all the time thinking things that may or may not be true. And, you know, the neat thing about poker is that often you're actually rewarded for making good assumptions. The problem, though, is that um, people usually go overboard. I have a few coaching students who habitually have this problem where they'll present a hand and then they'll say, I know my opponent does blank and blank and blank and blank because they've seen them do one or two things over the last one or two hours. Now you have to ask, why would you think someone's doing something all the time just because they do it every once in a while? And they say, oh, that's just how they play. Like, how do you know? Making generic guesses is a significant mistake that will cost you loads of money. So I have a few, a few uh, examples of assumptions that people make. And they'll make it hard for you to win at poker. So let's get through these. First, number one assumption most people make is that everyone else plays the same as you. Or that they think the same as you, that they have the same ranges as you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is just straight up not true, right? Because maniacs play different than nits. And even then, some good players play differently than other good players, right? So, what do I think whenever I get to the table? How do I think my opponents play? Well, there are some generic stereotypes that you can use to try to presume how particular players will play, but I'm definitely not basing or not risking significant money to find out. And the nice thing about poker tournaments, especially, and cash games, is that you're usually very deep stacked. So you essentially have plenty of time to develop real reads as opposed to generic assumptions. So first hand of the day, let's say you get four bet. What do people typically four bet with? Well, you don't want to say my opponent's a good, strong GTO player because most people are not good, strong GTO players. Most players who you do not know, completely random player to you, they may be middle-aged guy, right? That's a read right there. Um, they are probably not four betting light all that often. You know, if they do, then um, they got you and it's okay. And you should move on with your life. Instead of like five betting it with the ace jack suited or ace jack off suit or ace five suit or whatever you decide to do, just don't do it. You don't need to. It's completely unnecessary. And playing like a GTO robot, thinking, all right, my opponents are playing perfect GTO, is asinine. And if you do that, you're going to leave a whole lot of money on the table. So you need to figure out what your opponents are doing wrong, not what you think you do wrong or what would work against you or making the assumption that they have the range that you would have, right? I'm telling you, this is a very basic thing that even the best players in the world have a hard time doing. Uh, an internet troll the other day tried to break apart some video I, I made saying, oh, this is terrible because a GTO bot would crush this strategy. Yeah, no crap. We're not trying to teach people to play against GTO bots. That's easy to do. Just get the GTO bot program and run it against itself. I'm trying to teach people to win against real opponents who make real mistakes. And that is how you actually succeed at poker. Um, so realize that people do not play like you. People do not think like you. Your opponents may not be someone else's opponents. Something else that happens a lot is that people like to think that other people are bad because the games that they play are different than the games that other people play. You see um, this a lot from just like cash game players and tournament players or live players to online players, right? All of this is interesting because people, essentially people who make this mistake don't have enough experience to understand that different player pools play differently. 
and different strategies are required to beat various player pools. Great example of this is take live cash games, for example. You're going to find that it's pretty clear that the people who win at 1-2 move up to 2-5. Okay? That means 2-5 is to some extent populated by winning 1-2 players who cannot beat 2-5 or who are grinding their way up through 2-5. So what does that mean? That means the strategies required to beat 1-2 are very often different than the strategies required to beat 2-5, right? And that's important to recognize. Same thing, strategies to beat 2-5 are different than the strategies to beat 5-10 and all the way up the ladder, right? Online, the, the typically bleeds a little bit more to where 1-2 may be roughly the same as 2-5, which may be 1-2-4, whatever they play online, roughly the same as 3-6, et cetera. But um, in live, there's like a very, very clear distinction. So same, same thing, there's a bit of a bleeding in tournaments because you can't put in enough volume at specific games. But like 1-2 players typically play 1-2 all the time or most of the time, whereas um, like 2-5 players play 2-5 for the most part. So you, you find very specific player tendencies. Ed Miller discussed how to move up in stakes and stay there. And... Um, in my book, Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, and he, he basically runs through this. Essentially, you have to figure out what the winning players are doing to beat the lower games, and then how do you beat that strategy, because that's what the winning players are doing in the higher stakes to beat those players, right? All right, next assumption, that you are unlucky. So many people out there think that they run poorly, and to be fair, maybe they do, but it doesn't really matter. You're going to find that even if you do play... If you put in a lot of volume, okay, you will have, even if you're like, let's say you are actually something like a five big blind per hundred hand winner, eight big blind per hundred hand winner. If you just put in volume, you will inevitably run, if you're running poorly, obviously you could just be like the most unlucky player in the world. You will inevitably run profitable, right? You may not be like nice straight up profitable, but you may be a little bit profitable. With swings, you know, you'll have swings, but... That's a situation where a lot of people don't recognize that very often they are just not that good. Because if you're not that good and you're, like, let's say, a break-even player, you actually have to be lucky to win. And then you're not even accounting for the rake, right? The rake will make everybody a losing player if they are naturally break-even. So you have to be pretty good to actually win, right? And most people like to blame luck because they don't want to take a hard look at their actual strategies and their actual mindsets and their actual approach to poker and they don't recognize that they're just making blunders on a very very regular basis it's always important to be studying always important to be learning and realize that you're not lucky you have to take you have to be accountable for your results is what it amounts to even if poker is a game that is full of variance it's not really in the long term. I mean, in the long term, the winning players win and the losing players lose pretty definitively. The problem is, is a lot of people like to play two sessions and say, oh my God, I'm the most unlucky player in the world. Which just, it just doesn't matter, right? People focus on things that are irrelevant. And if you're focusing on things that are irrelevant, then um, <laughs> you're just not making, making good use of your time, right? Paul says he realized a lot of the bad luck is actually mistakes not seen. Very, very true. I mean, and you have to realize even very good players make mistakes. Almost no one plays perfectly all the time. I mean, Phil, uh, Phil Ivey talked about this a long time ago. He was like, yeah, I make multiple mistakes every post poker session. And now he's not saying I make mistakes as if I uh, knew exactly what my opponents have. But even then, like, he made some errors, right? I make errors sometimes. Whenever I, I just uh, took... 35th place at Borgata, and I went through my hand histories, and there were a few spots where some of my plays were like a little bit questionable, even in my mind, like reviewing it, right? I'm sure you could take the best player in the world, they look at it, and they find even a few more mistakes, right? And that's going to happen. So you have to recognize that you are not perfect, and there's always plenty of room to improve. A lot of people like to think that they are perfect, and that the only reason they have not had the success that others have is because they're unlucky. And that's just not true. Very often, they're just not that good. Um, another another uh, assumption people make is that if they just had a bigger bankroll, they could crush the higher stakes games. This is just definitively not true. If you cannot beat the lower stakes games, you very often cannot beat the higher stakes games, right? Um, 
people think that for some reason players playing closer to fundamentally sound poker is easier to play against. And it may be quote unquote easier to play against, but you're going to lose in the long run if your opponent's playing like a perfect robot and you're not. And as you get to the higher and higher stakes, very often the players are strong GTO players, but also they know how to maximally exploit their opponents. And that's something that so many otherwise good players miss is that it's not all about just um, playing like a robot. Um, so realize that if you had more money, that would not necessarily give you, well, it would give you a better chance to succeed, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win at the high stakes games. You, you probably wouldn't. I mean, it's quite egotistical to think that. And the great thing about poker is that if you just had a bigger bankroll, you could succeed. All you have to do, take the money you have, play within your bankroll, find a game you can beat, and play it a lot. That's it. And if you're good, you will rise to the top. And if you're not good, you will not rise to the top. It is really it is as simple as that. That may take you a little bit longer to rise to the top if you are being unlucky, which, which happens, right? I get it that it does happen. But you'll get there eventually, right? I mean, I started with $50, literal $50. This, this amount of money. And look, let me show you all. Look, at, look how good I am at poker. I've at least doubled my money. So yeah, I started with $50 a long time ago. And I was just much better than my opponents because they were not very good back in the day. And I played a lot. I put in a lot of volume, right? A lot of people out there do not really want to put in volume. Donk says it's uh, called a grind for a reason, and it is. Is it true that uh, you need to be really tight to profit? Um, against maniacs, it is. All in for poker says, thanks for putting together the masterclass with your cash game results have improved measurably. Well, you're very welcome. If you all are interested in that, check it out at pokercoaching.com slash cash. How many times have I gone broke in my life? Never. Um, I don't know why you would think that I am uh, not good with money, but no, I've never gone broke. And... It would be really silly to go broke, especially in today's environment where you actually have access to information, right? I started with $50. By the time I was um, 21, I think I had something like $350,000. So, you know, solid increase to my bankroll. And I just always played properly bankroll. Read jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. That's my bankroll Bible. It's completely free. There for you. And um, it, it explains exactly how I did what I did, right? Let's see. Going broke used to be a badge of honor. Yeah, used to be. Now it's a badge of bad bankroll management. And um, it's kind of interesting because back in the day, there was like no information, right? People did not understand that you just don't have to go broke. And back in the day, people had a volume problem. And the games were way softer. Think about this. The games are way softer, and you have a volume problem. Games are softer means invest more of your bankroll. If you have a volume problem, you don't actually get many opportunities. You kind of have to take every shot you get. I did not have that problem because I started playing online poker back in the day. There were infinite games to the point that I never really had to risk much of my bankroll, right? And, um, you know, the games were soft enough. They were nowhere near as soft as they were 25 years ago. But um, they're still soft. And so I got to play whatever stake I wanted, as much as I wanted, and um, could just grind it up as I felt, as I saw fit. Oh, look, the little baby's waking up. This might be a short episode if the little baby wakes up. Go back to sleep, little baby. Go back to sleep. Can you guys see it over here? There's the baby. Um, yeah, I started on Party Poker. Once they closed to Americans, I went to Poker Stars, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. Did I really screw up the focus on this? I think I maybe screwed up the focus. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> Hopefully it'll go back. Um, is there more variance in high variance games? Clearly, yes. So anyway, realize that just having a bigger bankroll does not necessarily indicate skill level and also just because you have more money does not necessarily mean you're going to win this is another assumption if i have x amount of money i am 
good enough to play a particular stake. Let's say you do follow my bankroll recommendations. Let's say you do have like 100 buy-ins for a tournament. Let's say you uh, were normally a $10 tournament player. You were keeping 100 buy-ins, maybe even 200 buy-ins. You had 10 or 20K to your name. And then you got lucky and won a big tournament for, let's say, $100,000. What do you do now? You double your, you 10X your bankroll or 5X your bankroll from 10 to 15, 20K to 100K. Do you all of a sudden start playing five to 10 times the size? You start playing $100 games. The answer is no. That would be really dumb because you do not, you likely do not have the skills to beat those stakes. And that's important to recognize. This happens to so many live tournament players where they get dumped a load of money by winning a tournament. And then they try to spin it up. And look, there's nothing wrong with spinning it up. Some of you mentioned Dan LeGrand who going broke a lot earlier. Um, I mean, he talks about this a lot. What he did is he would basically grind at the small stakes, take a big shot at a bigger soft game, play it, lose, and then go back down and grind again. Do that over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Whenever you have no responsibilities, no real desire to not be broke, right? Then, then who cares if you go broke? Who cares if you have to move back down? A lot of the best players, well, the, the highest stakes players you all know today, took shots like this. And this is a great way to give yourself a real chance to move up way faster than you would through the slow grind. Um, Tom Dwan, Phil Galfonder, great examples of this, where we were all playing the same sit and goes and cash games back in the day. And some of them started taking shots at like, we were both all playing 25, 15, no limit. Some of them started playing 200, 400 against Guy, the Circus Lay Arm. I didn't want to take that risk, but they were all willing to take the risk of putting up, you know, 50% of their bankrolls to play way higher than normal in a soft game. Kind of goes back to the old school gambler mentality, right? Where you don't have very many opportunities, but the game is really soft. So do you do it? I decided not to, and that very easily could have been a mistake. Um, but for every Tom Dwan and Phil Galfond who have lots of money now, six or eight of those, six, six or eight out of 10 of those people went broke because they lost one or two buy-ins, which was a third or half of their bankroll. And then they decided to do it again. Then they were done. And Barry and Scott, were they unlucky? Yeah, probably a little bit, but not like it was well within normal variance. And I did not want to risk that. I would much rather just keep 500 or a million dollars in my bankroll and not risk it because I didn't feel like I needed to. And I mean, still here today doing fine. And I have never, ever, ever had any real risk of ruin to my bankroll because that's not what I want in life. I'm naturally rather nitty. I'm not trying to give away my money and I'm not trying to have to go back in and put in infinite hours. In the ideal world, I get loads of money, I invest it all, then I can kind of do whatever I want. Fortunately, we're basically there. We're very near there. We're not quite there yet. I live in New York City. It's uh, expensive. I used to be set when I lived in Vegas. When I lived in Vegas, I was just like, good to go. And then I met my wife, who's from New York City, and everything here costs 10 times as much. So uh, it's going to be nice when we get out of here and I'll have all the money. But we're not out of here yet. Can you ever get a chance to see me play online? Whenever I go out of the country, I play online a decent amount. Um, do I play cash games or tournaments? Usually tournaments, because online cash games are tough. How many people spiked a million dollars and are no longer active in the game? A lot. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people keep trying to get another big score off that first one and end up losing it all. Um, yeah, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> Most of them don't make it. And to be fair, when I say don't make it, what a lot of them do is they'll win a million dollars, they'll buy a house for a few hundred thousand, they'll invest some of it, and then they have two or 300K left. And then they lose two or 300K and then they, they quit. My, my student who won 1.3 million recently on party poker, Blas Zerjow, he basically said he won 1.3 million. He's going to invest slash buy his mom a house, buy himself a house, where he's from, it's relatively cheap there. And um, then he's gonna invest the rest. So he basically will have like, let's say 800 or 700K invested. So he's just gonna make 30, 40, 50K a year off a really passive investment. And then he's gonna have 300K left over to play poker. And then he's gonna be playing like $1,000 buy-in tournaments and $2,000 buy-in tournaments. So he has 100 buy-ins, 150 buy-ins, 300 buy-ins, right? Plenty of bankroll. 
And he's doing exactly what I suggest he does. And um, he's going to make it. There's a chance he just goes broke. Well, goes broke, right? But he's still left with properties worth 300k and 700k in the bank. And that's essentially infinite money's where, where he is from, so he's good to go. Um, even in America, if you get a million dollars, it's not like you can just pack it up and be done most of the time. But you can still do pretty well. All right, other assumptions people make incorrectly. You should make the same play every time. A lot of people, again, go back to wanting to play like a GTO robot all the time against everyone. And that's just a big, big mistake. You may even have fundamentally sound default strategies in your mind, but playing them all the time, if they're not perfect, will cost you money. So, also, not adjusting to exploit your opponents will cost you money. This is why I try to teach my students a strategy they can implement at the table that is pretty strong, and then also I teach them how to adjust to take advantage of their opponents. So, whenever you're adjusting to take advantage of your opponents, you're just not blindly making the same play every time. If you're blindly following a solver, unless you're playing against very good opponents who you're not capable of figuring out what they do wrong, you're leaving money on the table. And the great thing about poker is if you're smart, you want to play in games where you can have a decent edge. A lot of people, especially online, beat their head against the wall playing in games where they have a tiny win rate, like three big blinds for 100 hands. And uh, they, they're not even winning much money. They have big upswings, big downswings, and it's brutal. <laughs> I don't know why you want to subject yourself to that. I would much prefer to subject yourself to having a nice high win rate, which is why I moved from online poker to live poker back in the day because win rates are just higher in live poker. Also, it's not such a grind where you're sitting in there trying to grind out a small profit all the time. And while there certainly is value and merit in playing a lot and getting experience, that is very often a good, a good strategy. All right, let's see. You, you missed, Mark says your favorite assumption. You missed the last five flush draws, so you know the next one's coming. You're due. Yeah, you're not due for anything. That should be clear. Uh, the idea of I am due for anything is um, completely asinine just because something has not happened. If anything means it's not going to happen in the future. Um, obviously, like a flush draw hitting, it's purely random. You know the odds of you hitting a flush draw. But, like, say I haven't cashed in 10 tournaments. What are the odds I cash in the next tournament? I would venture to say it's actually worse than, let's say, 15% of the field cash. It's probably a little bit lower, assuming you don't know your actual cash percentage or your actual win rate, right? Because, let's say you don't have good results, or you don't have a, you don't have a good uh, tracking system for your results, you don't know if you're a winning or losing player. If you lose 10 tournaments in a row, you're probably not very good. So if you're not very good, you should actually be cashing less than your 15%, right? Because you're not very good. So it's important to recognize that you probably overestimate your skill level. My first poker coach a long time ago taught me a lesson that's always stuck with me. It's basically that you should assume your win rate is about half of what you think it is. This is when you take good results. And then you should spend as if your win rate is half of that. So spend as if your win rate is 25% of what it appears to be based on the results. And you may say, doesn't that mean you're living too frugally or not enjoying your life, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're trying to move up, and I presume most of you here are trying to move up, you really want to keep money in your bankroll. I mean, I, I was a really great example of this, where I used to play 5 to 10 No Limit at Bellagio every day. And I was winning about $100 to $120 an hour playing that. I could win about $150 to $180 playing 10 20 but there's a lot more variance in that game because people were just better, right? So I played a lot of 5 10 and I was making twenty or $30,000 a month pretty much every month like clockwork. And I was watching these other players who I thought played equally well as me struggling to actually build their bankroll. Because like I was just flush with money because I, I was winning twenty or 30000 every month with no risk, right? So what were they doing wrong? And from talking to them, it turns out a lot of them would go out partying. They'd go out to fancy restaurants. They'd buy fancy stuff. And what happens is they essentially blew a lot of their money. Instead of holding on to their money, conserving their money, they would give it away to something. And that was a big mistake that made a lot of them be stuck there and not actually make lots of money out the door. 
Um, especially in Vegas, I guess any city in theory, but especially in Vegas, it's very, very easy to lose your money on various things. Lose your money, spend your money, give your money away, whatever. How many sessioners do I play in a normal day of work? Zero or one. Turns out bottle service isn't a good investment. You know, bottle service is a fine investment once a year <laughs> or something like that. Uh, if you're splitting it five ways or 10 ways. Bottle service is not a good investment every single night. Look, don't get me wrong. I think there is plenty of merit in being happy and enjoying your life and enjoying the financial success that you gain. But um, not to a detriment, not, not, to, not to the destruction of yourself. Why tournaments over cash games? Why not just play more cash games? Because the, once you get a decently large bankroll, the buy-in you can buy in for cash games that are soft becomes very, very small, right? Like, let's say you have a million dollars to your name. Do you really want to go play 510 where you have a thousand buy-ins? Ideally, you'd rather play bigger, right? So if you play bigger, the problem with that is that your win rate may go down and your variance is gonna go through the roof, typically. Sometimes not always. So if that's the case, what do you do? How do you play bigger and still play in soft games? Well, tournaments are a great example. You get to buy in for $3,500, which if you think about it, the way it kind of works is most of the time you lose, but when you get in the money, now you're basically playing a $35,000 buy-in tournament on average. Where else are you gonna get to play with those players for $35,000, for $35,000 effective buy-in? It just doesn't happen. What about when you make the final table? You may be playing a, um, I don't know, maybe playing like a $100,000 tournament or $300,000 or $300, effective tournament, right? And you just don't get to play $300,000 effective dollar tournaments uh, very often. Some of you are saying on Instagram, my, my Instagram is messing up. I'm going to, should I end this? No, we're just going to keep it. This doesn't work. Uh, try, well, we'll watch the replay of this. The replay of this will be fine. All right, what else? All of you are saying, what about this Mike, uh, Mike Possel issue? I discussed this the other day. Go back and watch it. I talked about it for 20 minutes because all of you were going off. But essentially, people made assumptions that he's probably cheating. They looked into it. Turns out he probably is, or definitively is. I'm not exactly sure if you can say definitively, but yeah, he, he's doing it. My problem with what a lot of people were doing, I made a little coffee about this saying, why are you defending Mike Possel? Because I'm not. Don't act like that. If you, if you think that, you are not listening to the words I'm saying and are emotionally charged about something. Um, a lot of people are now accusing anyone he knows and anyone he's associated with, with must, they have to be involved. And while they should be looked into, you can't say that everyone he knows is definitively a cheater, right? Because I've known people who have done shady things. And to be fair, I've done shady things when I was a young kid. I was a young, dumb kid, and that was bad. And I've learned, and I've, I've significantly changed my life, right? And just because people knew, just because you know someone who does bad things does not mean that you are all of a sudden a horrible person, right? Or a, an obvious cheater. And that's what's being thrown around on the internet. People are very, very close to, are very, very, very quick to jump on the bandwagon is what it amounts to. Someone says something, people are like, yeah, that's true. Um, someone else said that I am uh, clearly... I have, I have no, no desire to have fair and, uh, what was the word they used? Basically, I don't care about game security because I said that we should leave investigations to proper investigators. And uh, they were saying that it's my responsibility, Jonathan Little's responsibility, to get up, fly to Sacramento, go to Stone's Gambling Hall, interview every single person in, who could potentially be involved, Take that report, give it to the California Gaming Commission, and um, then try to prosecute the person in court, which is asinine, right? It's very important to know your role, right? My role is not to be an investigator, lawyer, and prosecutor. It's not my role. There are people whose role that is. For example, my lawyer, Mac Verstandig, he already has a class action suit ready to go. And... That is his role, right? 
It's very important to realize what your job is and do it accordingly. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that people think that just because you are not saying things like, I'm going to go and do the investigating myself, means that you don't care about game security. Like, how asinine is that thought process? Like, what logic could these people have to jump from point A to point B? Because obviously I care about game security. Obviously I care about making sure cheaters get, get caught and don't cheat. And I'm very interested in how they are doing it, because that way you can be aware of it and be looking to stop it. But, like, I'm not an expert on cheating at live poker, right? In what world would they think me, or any other random poker player who does not cheat, is an authority on cheating at poker? So logical, right? But California, California Gaming Commission knows about this kind of stuff. That is their role. And also, I'm not gonna like take people to to to. Uh, I, I'm not gonna take people to court. Jonathan Little, my lawyer's gonna do it. Anyway, a lot of people's thought process about this whole thing is ridiculous. They're turning it into a, a lot of drama to get eyeballs on their content, which, hey, that's fine. That's a lot of people's prerogatives. They want to get you to look at their stuff, so they make lots and lots of drama. And I say, okay. But recognize, as a consumer, you are what you consume, and if you're consuming drama, well, you're certainly not improving at poker or life. So just keep that in mind. Let's see. Have you ever tried to bank blackjack at Converse? No. Um... Does my Cash Masterclass work on Finnish live poker games? Probably. And you have to understand that the Cash Masterclass is designed to teach you how to play fundamentally sound and then how to adjust to various players you will encounter. And um, you will... You will inevitably learn about how to play those various players that you will encounter. Louis Philippe says, Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Indeed, indeed. Supposedly Stones had an independent investigator. Yeah, so something that I think Stones did quite poorly is they said, we are having an investigation happen. And um, clearly Stones, the place where the incident happened, is not um, a good person to run the investigation. The California Gaming Commission should be running the investigation. I watched the investigation videos. Oh, I didn't know they had the interviews out yet. If you all have links to the interviews of Mike, everybody else who works at the casino and on the stream, and the players, I would love to see the investigation videos. That would be very, very helpful. If you're all referring to live streams, that, that's not an investigation. That is watching live streams. Let's see. Let the lawyers and authorities handle it. So there certainly is merit in draw, drawing attention to something, right? Because if people, if attention gets drawn onto something, then inevitably more lawyers and more authorities will be aware of it, right? If um, something is kept on the down low, that's uh, not necessarily a thing. So th that's not necessarily going to result in the just result, right? But once the authorities have their attention drawn on it, and it's clear people care about it, let the authorities do their job. Let's see. You like my style. Thank you. So you shouldn't watch seven hours of Polk and Ingram yucking it up. It's okay to yuck it up. Do whatever you want. I'd rather be studying and working. Am I considering a poker coaching fan meetup in Jacksonville? Not really, and the reason is because... Uh, well, so listen. I tell you what. Will. Will and everybody else. If you want a Jacksonville fan meetup, send me an email. Support at pokercoaching.com. And um, if I get five emails, I will do something. If I don't get five emails, I will not do something. How do you lose banking on blackjack in the long run? You don't always get to bank, and you have to pay the casino to play each game. And what happens is people play the minimum against you when you're banking. That's how you lose. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Lots and lots of text today. Some people just find the uh, the whole cheating interest incident interesting. Sure, right? Do whatever you want. It is A-OK -okay to consume whatever content you want. I get it that a lot of people love the drama. They love going back and watching old streams to try to put together the pieces. And that's fine. 
I have stuff to do. I'm, I'm going to let the authorities deal with that. I already know my personal lawyer, Mac Versandig, is on the case. He is a fantastic gambling lawyer. And that's his job. He does his job, right? My job is to help all of you improve your poker and your life. I mean, for example, yesterday, I didn't sit around watching people discuss old poker streams all day. I worked on a book and I made training videos. I did that literally all day yesterday. I wrote about 7,000 words on playing fundamentally sound strategies in multi-way pots. We discussed that just the other day, right? Still working on it. So um, anyway, anyway, other assumptions. Well, an assumption a lot of people make that would be very wrong is that um, just because you don't find value in, um, just because you don't find value in watching people yuck it up means that there is no value in that. But it is very important to recognize that there is value in that. People, a lot of people, are into poker and games for entertainment. I discussed this in a, an article I wrote, gosh, many years ago now, um, about the three various types of game players. The main type of game player wants, these, a lot of plays for primarily the social aspects of the game. So when things like drama happen, they love it. They love, love, love the drama. And there's nothing wrong with that. People play games for entertainment, for social aspects, and things like someone cheating out in the public for a long time and winning money off small stakes players draws people together. It's a great social thing where everyone agrees that you should not be cheating at poker, right? And that's fine. That's fine and good, right? And, and I recognize this, which is why, I, I mean... There's certainly merit in, in doing, doing things that you enjoy. And if you play poker for the social aspects, then feel free to do it. I think in general what actually happens of the three types of players, there are the players who care about the social aspects of the game, players who care about making fun plays and creative plays, and then players who care about winning. I think you're actually probably like a percentage of each one. So say you can have 100%. I'm probably like 7% social aspect. 1% make creative plays, and uh, what, 98% 98% uh, trying to win the game, right? Doug and Joey did a great job of going over hands. I, I mean, sure, I definitely think so. I mean, why not, right? They're both good poker players. I think a lot of people think that just because I, like, imagine, imagine I mean, I've watched zero, zero minutes of their content on this. It's because they're doing it already. I don't need to do that. I don't need that entertainment, right? Because my so social aspect score is very, very low. A lot of your social aspect scores out there are like 95 because you're not a winning poker player, which implies you don't care about winning. Because if you actually care about winning, you really care about it in your heart of hearts, you will find a way to win. Perhaps unless you have like a degenerate gambling problem, like a mental disorder, then maybe you won't. But all content is not for everyone. Right? It's important to know your role and know what you're trying to accomplish and know what you're trying to do. All right, let's see. Thanks for my professionalism on the situation. It's great. Well, I do my best. And look, I, I realize that a lot of people get emotionally charged when it comes to things that outrage them, right? I mean, look at politics. Politics is a great example of this. Whether you're what, whatever you care about in politics, people get s severely outraged to the point that they can't think and listen to the other side's arguments and thoughts, right? And that, that's a big problem. A lot of people have this desire, or it's like either you're either um, fighting or you're horrible, right? And that's just not the case. You're allowed to sit back and observe, right? You don't have to get involved. How does one go about improving their life when it falls out of whack? Well, Joe, how did it fall out of whack? What do I think of Atlantic City casinos? I um, actively do not like the idea that Borgata, in my opinion, stole Phil Ivey's money. I'll still go there and play, but um, I definitely do not like that. What are my thoughts on quality, good mindset, confidence, feeling good versus quantity, mass volume? You need both, and you need to figure out how to have good quality while also having a good quantity. And that may mean not give, not put in so much time at the table. So instead of putting in, let's say, 60 hours a week, maybe you put in 40 hours a week. Um, my mindset coach, Elliot Rowe, talks about this a lot. Unfortunately, um, I've never really had this issue. I'm good at putting in volume. 
But a lot of poker players, especially online, are not good at putting in volume because it it kind of sucks to sit there and play online poker all day, every day. But if that's your job, you're supposed to sit there and play online poker a lot, especially during the big series, right? I mean, I guess I go through a little bit of this during the World Series where I'm playing 12 hours of poker every day for, for months, but that's that's an oddity, and I, I recognize that's my job, and I just do it. Um, so you need to figure out how to be happy and put in the grind at the same time. How many sessions would it take before you see red flags? So I actually played with a guy who was cheating um, when I was young. I must have been 19 or 20 in a live, live game in Pensacola, Florida. What this guy did, I caught them on the first session, <laughs> is essentially the way the game worked is let's say I deal the hand, okay? I deal, hands over, I get the cards, I shuffle them, okay? Fine. So what this player was doing is I would shuffle the cards, I would stack the cards appropriately, and then the person to the left now cuts the deck and hands it to the next person, okay? So what all you need to do to run this easy cheat is know how to set the deck of cards, which this guy did. He passed it to his girlfriend, you know, who would always sit on his left, and then she would cut it appropriately. So, you know, you take the deck of cards, you stack it one where it's slightly off, they grab it in the right spot, and they cut it. And then the guy who deals the cards is oblivious to it, and he just happens to give one of the two of them good cards every time. And um, I figured this out after three or four hours, and I called him on it, and sure enough, the guy had the literal pocket aces. He was a very, very big man. I'm not such a big man, but he left. We, uh, we cashed him out. You know, whatever, you got us, and uh, I didn't hear from him again. And that's okay, right? So, if you did play at Stones, I mean, this is going to sound a little bit harsh, but if you did play on the Stones stream on a regular basis, if you cared about winning, then you should have been watching the stream on every player. And after a little while, you will see the same guy making absurd plays that work almost every time, or every time. It's every time it's like easy to find it, right? And you should be aware of that. The problem is a lot of people probably weren't watching the streams after the fact. I mean, I guess a lot of the commentators were almost like making a joke out of it about how he always always does the right play. Um, but it, it, it's harder to catch that kind of thing when you are actually playing because you don't actually get to see the cards all that often. And... As just a player without a stream, it might take a very long time to figure it out. Um, mine was easy because I, I'm, I like to study magic card tricks, and um, you could see the guy shuffling the cards doing, like back in the day, I could do all sorts of magic tricks. I can't remember any of them now. But I remember the guy was setting the deck a little bit funny, passing it off, always had his girlfriend on his left, passed it off, she cut it, same spot every time. It was obvious. Um, maybe what? Mike was doing was obvious. Maybe it wasn't. I don't know. Right? I don't know. And because uh, I wasn't there, right? So many people want Jonathan Little to do an investigation. I'm like, I'm not there. <laughs> I I'm in New York City. And I don't have access to all the employees. I don't have access to uh, the people who did it, right? Um, so anyway, it's a scenario where you don't know. You just don't know. And, and that's okay, right? It's okay to not know. But if you get the vibe that anything is a little bit suspicious, don't play. We live in a world where you can play poker in lots of places. In Sacramento, where Stone's Gambling Hall is, there's a casino literally right down the street called Thunder Valley that is a big, full casino. Stone's is a smaller place. Stone's is very nice, by the way. Um, there's a place right down the street. Maybe you find that this guy just crushes you on stream, but sucks otherwise. Maybe that's the case, right? How do you get staked for online cash games, considering that you've been playing well for a while, but not full time? Arjun, anytime you want to get staking, go to a staking group, provide good results, show you will put in good volume. That's usually all it takes. The problem is a lot of people want to get staking without good results, without putting in volume, and then you're just not going to get it. You have to be deserving of it. Oh, let's see. What's advice someone relative to do the game who can get one session in? Well, study as much as you can because you're probably not all that good yet. Study a lot.
You didn't understand the comment I made about not wanting to, or not enjoying playing at Borgata so much? Well, Borgata did this thing to Phil Ivey where they let Phil Ivey make a game, and then he beat them at the game, and then they did not pay him millions of dollars. And um, millions of dollars, uh, it, that's pretty brutal. And the thing is, is I'm not, I'm not a big fan of their, of their play. Of, of Borgata's, Borgata's strategy, essentially like that. Let's see... D-Trip says, uh, horrible take there. Never play at Thunder Valley. For cash-only tournaments. Well, whatever. Look, again, you have access to games. Would you rather play in a game where you think someone is being shady? Maybe the place is nicer, right? Stones is, Stones is very nice. Like I said, it's nice. They have good food. Venue's nice. Would you rather play there where someone may be cheating you? Or would you rather go to a different place where maybe it's not so nice? Maybe they rake more. Maybe the uh, maybe they smoke right inside the casino. Who knows? And um, but you, you don't get cheated, right? I mean, I purposefully don't play home games for a reason. Many reasons, actually. First off, you could go to jail. You could go to jail. You could get in trouble, right? I don't want to get in trouble. Next, um, you could get cheated. Clearly, there are actually a few instances of. People cheating, apparently similar to the way Mike's doing it, in other home games that never really got in the light of day because in home games there's no law, right? Um, next, you could not get paid. In New York City, it's a common thing where if you win, they'll pay you like 50 big blinds per session. <laughs> so if you win, a, win 500 big blinds, you just can't get paid. You have to keep coming back. Uh, the rake is gigantic. Um, I know a guy I used to play in one of the more well-known home games. I played there a few times. And he said that no player besides exactly him, and he's a super nit, which is how you beat um, is how you beat uh, games with a high rake. The um, he was the only winner among anyone who played more than three sessions, literally three sessions. Why is that? Because they rake so much. So four things right there make me not want to play these games. So I don't play them. Yeah, you get robbed sometimes. Don't forget that. There's five. Um, you'd much rather the police come than robbers come. I think. Uh, so anyway, five five reasons. Not to play home games. So I don't play them, right? People always ask, why don't you play why don't you play home games all the time? They're soft. Yeah, but the rank is gigantic. And you have to recognize that. You have to realize that um, just because a game exists does not mean that you have to play. What's the best free way to study? Go get a trial membership to pokercoaching.com. It's completely free. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com, read all of the blog posts, watch all the videos, watch all the weekly poker hand content, and take notes and study. Um, another assumption, everyone is bad. So many people out there love to say that other people are bad because they don't play exactly like they play. And that is quite a poor assumption because clearly if someone is winning at a decent rate, they're probably pretty good. Um, I mean, there are so many live poker players, like in, in places, like live poker tournaments, right? Where I say, obviously they're not cheating. They're not cheating. And they're good. They win. They make plays that I don't understand. Other, my friends don't understand, but they succeed. Phil Helmuth is a good example of this, right? He makes all sorts of absurd plays, and a lot of people really get off on calling him bad. Again, they jump on the bandwagon, right? They try to say, oh, I think this guy's bad, so I need to, uh, I need to make fun of him or whatever. And that's ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous because just because you don't get it, doesn't mean that they are not good at poker. Um, I think I mentioned this in the last stream. There was actually a player who won a WPT, won a bunch of World Series circuit rings, and my friends and I were pretty convinced he was cheating some way, in some way. We thought he was using the uh, contact lenses with invisible ink method, which is a solo method to cheat. Obviously, it's very risk-heavy, because if anyone catches you, you just go straight to jail. Um, but anyway, we assumed he must be cheating. So, whenever I got my cards, I would cover them up completely to where he could not see my cards. Um, he won a bunch of money, crushed the games, uh, but then he stopped winning, and then he lost all of his money. Why? Because he wasn't actually very good. He was just lucky. You can be really lucky. A long time ago, one of my friends, Irie Guy, said uh, something to the effect of, you can run way, way worse than you think is possible, and the same, you can run way, way better than you think is possible. I have uh, won or taken second place in two tournaments back-to-back -to -back, twice in my career. Think of the odds of that, right? If there's 300 people in the tournament. I'm 1 in 300 times 1 in 300. 
two and three hundred times two and three hundred or whatever you want to do, whatever weird stat you want to come up with. It's not a whole lot that that's going to happen, and it's happened twice. How did that happen twice? There's a hell of a lot of variance in poker. So, realize that. Also, I've gone, I think, 40 tournaments in a row with no caches, twice. What are the odds of that? We're 15% to cash each time. Do the math. It's pretty low. And that just happens. Such is life, right? I mean, I've been on a heck of a run recently. I think I've played like 20 live tournaments recently over the last year or two. Maybe 25, maybe 30. Whatever. I think I final tabled three WPTs. I won, won the Hard Rock tournament the other day. I mean, I'm actually running pretty hot despite like never playing, right? So um, there's a lot of variants. But anyway, don't assume that people are bad just because they don't play like you play. That is a classic novice mistake. And uh, to think that makes you very, very dense. And you do not want to be dense. So many people, especially general, generally analytical people, who think they are smart and think that they know a lot, they, um, they presume that their way is the only way. And it's not. Is there a section in Poker Coaching Premium for shorthanded play? Yeah, just GTO. One of my students, who is a world-class GTO player, he has a six-handed or a short-handed uh, GTO video or two on Poker Coaching Premium. Not exactly sure where that's at. Send us an email. It's support at pokercoaching.com if you can never find that. Why does everyone assume you should tip the dealers after you have a winning session? Are you cheap? We're not going to get into dealer tipping today. I think it's a little bit silly that the casinos don't pay their employees a fair wage. You're really enjoying the cash game course? The other sites are a bit confusing. Well, I know. I tried to make a, a good course. A good course, very concise, easily laid out, and something you could search to find whatever issue you have. I mean, imagine any question you have about poker. I probably answered it on Poker Coaching Premium. Just find it, watch the video, have your problems solved. Um, you're a little bit lost on how to study Poker Coaching Premium. All right, so go through the cash game course. I think that is highly valuable. Also, take notes. If you're passively watching, you need to be taking notes. Pause the videos, etc., etc. Make sure you are actually studying and working hard. Ooh, I just saw Instagram's about to fall down and die. I have this device here. Hello, Instagram. I have this device here. And I just realized before the stream, I had not charged it for um, like two weeks. And I was thinking, huh, this is going to run out of battery soon. And it just died. I just saw it blinking. Put this over here. How do I do this? Can I put Instagram right here for today and not look at it anymore? Is that okay? All right. Sorry, Instagram. Bad show for the rest of the day. Enjoy yourselves. Um, you joined poker coaching months ago, a month ago and you're learning tons. Well, that's the goal. Can I make you a winning tournament player? Probably. This goes back to the idea of are you willing to start small and take it slow? I generally make the assumption that if someone has been around poker for a decent amount of the time and they are not really having great success, that... The assumption, which may or may not be right, is that they don't actually want to sit and do the grind. They just want to get rich quick. And that's a problem. You have to be willing to sit down and grind. So if you're willing to sit down and grind and play in games that are small, then, then sure. Um, actually, in Florida, just recently at Hard Rock, where I, where I won that tournament, uh, someone came up to me out of the blue and said, hey man, I just wanted to thank you. I'm a good cash game player, but I've, I've played tournaments every once in a while and I always lose. But then I found Poker Coaching Premium, studied all of it, and now I decided to play the 25K, which was, you know, a fine buy-in size for him. And um, he, he made the final table. So, uh, you know, <laughs> just, just study, put in the work, and you'll be good to go. That said, I realize everyone is not as smart as everyone else and there are certainly natural skills that make you more inclined to be better or worse at poker than others but you can make some number of uh you can make some amount of profit just just putting in putting in the the grind even at the small six games do you like new york city except the cost i don't really mind the cost actually i think the cost are a great motivator a lot of people um think that having to make or needing or like essentially having to spend a lot of money each month is a detriment but for things like the apartment we pay what eight nine thousand dollars a month for the apartment 
and like we own it, right? So I'm, I'm banking some of that money and it forces you to get in there and actually do great work. It's not like I'm just, I'm not renting. So, I mean, that, that's at least nice. And um, after 20 or 30 years, we'll own a quite expensive apartment, which is good. I think it's actually on a 15 year, 15 year mortgage. Audio is bad on Instagram. Well, I'll look into that. Sorry about that. If you see a freakishly high number of bad hands, cooler, second best hands, et cetera, do you suspect cheating? No. I, as a default, do not suspect cheating because the penalty for cheating is incredibly severe unless you're in a home game. In a home game, uh, yeah, just like I said, I don't play those very, very often at all. Um, but in a live casino, the penalty is so severe for cheating, like you go to literal prison, that most people are not going to even attempt to cheat. So no, the default in my mind is that is standard variance. To tournament pros, I'm not sure what you're saying. Anyway, you got a lot out of my situational poker app. That's called Instapoker. If you like Instapoker, check out pokercoaching.com. We have over 600 quizzes just like those, except that they're even more advanced. And they... Um, it has me and the other poker coach and coaches going through our thoughts for every single possible decision, right? So we say, you, everyone folds to you in the cutoff. You have pocket eights, preflop. Do you fold? No. Do you limp? No. Do you raise to two big blinds or do you raise to three big blinds? And one of those plays is probably best. So let's say you raise to three big blinds because we're deep stacked. Big blind calls, flop comes nine, six, two. Your opponent checks. What do we do? Do we check? Bet small, bet medium, or bet big. And then I'll explain. You click the button, you tell me what you would do, and then I explain which play I think is best, what the other coach thinks is best. What I consider a standard buy in online. Read jonathanlillipoker.com slash bankroll. Depends on your variance, your win rates, your standard deviation. But um, in tough games, 100, more, et cetera, et cetera. Flattering angle on Instagram. Yes, thank you. Uh, Instagram angle is quite poor. I, sh I wish I could just like attach this right here, but I can't. My device, my device broke. Believe it or not, hello, there's Instagram. Can you all see Instagram here? We have a bit of a jerry rig setup, but that's because you can't stream to Instagram using exactly your computer setup. You can stream everywhere else on it using your computer setup, but I don't know why Instagram doesn't do that. Dylan got it right. 962, you have range advantage and nut advantage. So bet small and frequently, easy game. But as you see, like going through spots like that over and over and over again will help you learn how to play the most common spots you encounter. And it's, it's like playing poker without actually having to risk your money and, without, and while you have like a coach sitting over your shoulder telling you the merits and the, I guess, demerits of all the other options. How often do I clean the Hard Rock Trophy? I've never cleaned the Hard Rock Trophy. It's very new. To be fair, I have another Hard Rock trophy way up there. I don't know if you can see it. It's a guitar. All right. When I start to play tournaments, how many do you play for the day? In live poker, one or two. Online, I'll usually 12 tables, 16 tables, something like that, depending, unless I'm playing much higher stakes. I'm pretty good at multi-tabling. I used to 24 table and 16 table sit and goes all day, every day. So I'm, I'm quite good at that. So that's a skill that I've worked hard to develop and I'm pretty good at that. That said, it's not the best for actually getting better at poker. And that's more of my goal now is to just continuously improve and think about every single decision as opposed to just put in a lot of volume. All right. So that's me at four today. Everyone asking, what are my thoughts on this scandal? Go back and watch the most previous, a little coffee. And um, I discussed it for the first 20 minutes. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Be nice to someone. Improve the world. Don't tear it down. Have a great, great day. Have a great weekend. I hope you win all the money. I'll talk to you later.